A property boom is great for those who are already in the market. Or is it? What risks are rising prices masking? What about people who buy through FOMO and overpay for the wrong property at the peak of the market? What about those whose property has lost value even while others are raking it in? And what about people who are left behind who will never be able to afford their own home? Should the last person in shut the door behind you? Or is it something that we really should be worried about, this unaffordability crisis? Welcome to The Elephant in the Room. This is the podcast where we love to talk about the big things in property that never usually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent, co-host of Foxtel's Location, Location, Location Australia and author of Auction Ready. And I'm Chris Bates, mortgage broker. Before we get started, I need to let you know that nothing we say on here can be taken as personal advice. We always recommend you engage the services of a professional. Don't forget that you can access the transcript for this episode on the website as well as download our free full or forecast report Which experts can you trust to get it right? Theelephantintheroom.com.au Eliza Owen is the Head of Residential Research Australia at CoreLogic and part of her remit is my favourite report, the CoreLogic Quarterly Pain and Gain Report. But recently she featured on a Four Corners episode about the affordability crisis in Australia and she's back with us today to discuss this, amongst other things, including whether the crazy price growth that we've been experiencing across this country is on the cusp of slowing down. Thank you so much for joining us, Eliza. It's been a while and I always enjoy a chat with you. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be here again. Now, I'm really interested in hearing what you think is causing the affordability crisis. But before we get into that, we're recording this on November the 2nd and CoreLogic's October price data came out yesterday showing a slowing down of price growth. And and when I say that, I mean Sydney house prices only went up 1.6% in the (laughs) month versus a high of 3.5%. But can you give us a quick snapshot? And I know that we're going to probably release this episode in December, but, you know, I think a quick rundown of what's happening across the country with prices as we head to Christmas. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm really glad you made that distinction because I think when we talk about the October release, a lot of people were talking about, oh, so um, prices are coming off a bit. And it's like, that's not it at all. Australia's housing market grew by 1.5% in the month of October. And what we're seeing is that that rate of increase has slowed from a peak back in March of 2.8%. And as you mentioned before, the peak in uh, a really rapidly rising market like Sydney was around 3.7% back in March, and that's now eased to 1.6%. But to put that into perspective at the national level, if you look at the decade average movement of property values in Australia, uh, it's a growth rate of about half a percent. So to still have growth rates of 1.5% through October is, is a pretty strong result, even if it's not as strong as what we've become used to through this upswing. Yeah. Now, yeah. <laughs> so looking at uh, kind of a wrap of, of prices around the country, at the national level, we're continuing to see um, houses largely outperform units where uh, we did see a pretty good month for regional Australia where values were up around 1.9% um, compared to a 1.5% increase across the capitals. And across the capital cities, growth rates ranged from a 2.5% increase across Brisbane, which was the leader of the capital cities for the month. And then across some of the smaller capital cities like Hobart, Adelaide and Canberra, they had about a 2% increase. Um, Melbourne was up 1%. uh, Sydney was up around 1.5%. And then a little bit weaker in Darwin um, and Perth, where Values were pretty much flat. In Perth, we've seen the first signs of a a decline um, where values were down 0.1% over the month. Poor old Perth. I mean, I don't think they've actually recovered from where they were 10 years ago anyway, have they? Not quite. Um, Dwelling values are still sitting, I think it's about 3.5% below the record high, which was back in 2014. If you look at the Perth cycle from 2014 to um, 2020, there was this peak to trough decline of about 18% in dwelling values. So it does speak to uh, a, a bit of a 
uh, loss for, for people who bought in at that peak uh, and just goes to show that not every market reliably delivers these extraordinary gains every five years or so. And I think that that's very um, a good message that everybody needs to understand because, I mean, I sort of jump in a lot of, lot of Facebook groups for investors and I like to hear the questions that are being asked and there's a lot of chatter around Perth as, as an opportunity and, and affordability and all these words that really should not be mixed in with investment. Um, but the other thing too I think is interesting is that, you know, you talk about the apartments uh, having underperformed houses. And we've had this conversation many, many times mm. where the apartment, well, all this data is aggregated, isn't it? So you've got a lot of, you've got a lot of inner city uh, apartments in Sydney and Melbourne, which we all know have been very affected by COVID uh, disproportionately, I guess, compared to, you know, all the market segments yeah. across the country. So that will be dragging that down. But Hobart, it absolutely defies conventional wisdom around population <laughs> and wages, doesn't it? Yeah, it it is a um it's been a really interesting market in the sense that over the longer term there are these structural barriers to its its growth in the sense that um Population growth, it, it hasn't been too bad. There was actually a bit of a surge in international migration before the onset of COVID, which could have carried over to housing demand to an extent. But there are things like, um, you know, for a long time, the economy was kind of held back. Um, it, it, it had the lowest rates of high school graduation of the states and territories, for example. But what it sort of happened in the past five years was this boom in really tourism, I would say. And we've also seen a bit more in the way of interstate migration, um, Tasmania being seen as a place that is popular with retirees. It's a place that's been popular um, with, with climate refuge even. Mm. Um, and I think that really speaks to the long-term prospects of that market. So over the past year, um, dwelling values across Tasmania have seen the, the biggest uplift, essentially, um, with values up, uh, I think it's around 28% over the past 12 months. And it kind of had a renewed boom through COVID because the the cycle was sort of looking as if it was going into a downswing. And then when you got the reduction of the cash rate towards the end of 2020, that kind of um, – yeah, really, really renewed and, and created a new upswing across that market. What it's also meant is that there's extraordinary pressure now on the rental market um, and the the flourish of domestic tourism through closed international borders, I think, puts additional pressure where you get more investment properties going to, say, um, Airbnb accommodation or just not enough development of, of new um, stock. So that that's really hard for people who are on relatively low wages. And in the course of the past five years, Hobart has gone from the most affordable city to one of the least affordable cities. I think it's around the, the third or fourth least affordable cities in terms of just the, the median dwelling value. That is such a dramatic shift to take place over the space of just five years. Yeah, it's pretty horrible, really, I think, it, for, for the locals. Mm. I think that started, though, really with investors as well, didn't it? Because Hobart became the sort of the the big poster child for all those borderless investors to say, right, now's the time. And so they all flooded into that market. And interesting that you say that it hasn't helped the rental side of things. Um, that displacement, though, from a combination of sea and tree changes in investors, that, that's happening yep. in regional areas across the country, though, isn't it? Correct. Correct. Yep. Yep. Um, and if you look at um, some of the top performing sub markets, so if we go like deeper than kind of the state and territory level, the highest value increases have taken place across regions like the Southern Highlands and Shoal Haven, um, the Sunshine Coast, um, the uh, sort of Richmond Tweed area, where values have increased more than 30% over the past 12 months. And as you say, that creates more uh, affordability pressures for locals in those areas. Now, all of those areas you've mentioned there, maybe with the exception of Richmond Tweed, are within sort of a two-hour commute of mm. a major city. Um, and Richmond Tweed, I mean, what, say three hours, I mean, you've got Byron Bay, that's almost like it's its own metropolis, yeah. isn't it, in a way? <laughs> um, 
but obviously it's connected to Brisbane. But a lot of people also are buying their second home. So this is not just people evacuating the cities, if you like. It's actually people then saying, right, well, I'm going to, you know, if I can't go overseas on my skiing holidays, I can afford a second home Mm -hmm. or I can do, I can live in two places because I've got this idea of a a partial commute and and partial working from home. I mean, are having two homes and borderless investing immoral? When, When you really look at the impact on these regional areas, I'm starting to that's what I'm starting to think, actually. I think that when it comes to individual decision making, we need to be careful about how we vilify investors within a financial system that has allowed them and even encouraged them in some instances to to make these kinds of investments. I think if you were to have a more systematic approach, maybe government regulation around the portion of properties that can be dedicated to Airbnb or, um, yeah, I don't know, some kind of limitation on, on finance for Um, holiday homes or or tax treatment of holiday homes, right? It's those kind of adjustments that you would need to tweak in the regions to preserve housing for locals, for long-term renters, um, because it's no good saying, well, we'll just, you know, build more housing or, or develop more housing when you can't allocate the way that that housing ends up becoming purchased and occupied. As you noted, Veronica, um, investment purchases include people just buying holiday homes. <laughs> um, great for some. And and maybe that is really something to aspire to as part of the Australian dream is having your permanent home as well as a little beachside home or, or what have you. But um, that's really hard to justify when you've got people that are experiencing homelessness or are really struggling in their their house with their housing costs. And I think that's it's it's a challenge and I agree with you. I mean we interviewed Ben Kingsley from Pika P I C A um a few weeks back really around investors being vilified because, you know, investors are blamed for first home buyers not being able to get into the market as well. And and, you know, it's often said that, oh, it's the um you know, the capital gains tax um, discount and all those things are really unfair. But, you know, I'm always yelling at the, te- at the television whenever there's some <laughs> expose on this because it's like it's never that simple, is it? You know, like with the capital gains tax uh, concession, that was brought in by the Howard government to simplify, uh, you know, the taxation regime because the reality, inflation is a tax deduction effectively. So, you know, so so it's, it's not quite... It, they don't really get 50% off. There's part of that growth has been inflation. Anyway, it's, that's a complicated uh, issue. And I agree, and I'm a property investor myself, and we provide a service, you know. But when we're displacing people in areas that we are not familiar with or even aware of, you know, the, the, yeah. the knock-on effect, I think that that's, um, that's a challenge. And I agree with you that there are the policy needs to be brave around this. You know, and policy needs to look at the whole problem, not not just little tiny bits of it. And we'll get yes. to a bit of that. Um, with the current mass exodus from the cities to the coast and country, and obviously you've said there was, what, 30% growth in some of these areas uh, over a 12-month period. That's outstripped all. I mean, Sydney has, oh, actually Sydney's experienced about the same, it's right? It's caught up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is bizarre. It's caught up, yeah. That throws another, you know, I love um, the myths in property. It's like, you mm-hmm. know, population is the foundation for, for price growth. It was like, actually, Sydney's population is reducing, except <laughs> prices are going up. Um, yeah. Once this initial surge, this sort of post-lockdown or post-lockdown Mark II, whatever you want to call it, surge of people making that move from from urban centres to regional areas, once that's passed, what do you think will happen with those markets? Yeah, that's a really good, I mean, it's a good observation in the sense that the surge in migration and surge in demand Uh, for regional Australian dwellings has come really post lockdown period. So we saw the big uplift between um, uh, sort of Q4 2020 and and Q1 2021. So we can expect that to to happen 
uh, now in, in the next few months. Um, the interesting thing about those migration patterns is that if you break it down by age group, there was a proportionally large uplift in people who were 65 and over going from capital cities to regions. I think that that kind of signals perhaps the disruption to the labour force from COVID has triggered some earlier retiree decisions as well. Um, maybe more tree change and sea change moves associated with that. Um, so in that sense, you know, when we start getting into 2022, there could be a bit of a drawback in that demand because a lot of it's been concentrated over periods within 2020, 2021. So it's like it's brought forward. Yeah, demand. exactly. Yeah. yeah. The, only, the only thing is there are all sorts of mitigating um, or, or tailwind factors to consider. What happens if the COVID crisis and the normalisation of remote work has actually triggered a virtuous cycles in the regions, whereby higher population means more economic demand, means more demand for employment means, you know, that, that attracts more people and that um, virtuous cycle continues. Or what happens if it goes the other way and um, corporations who have already taken out leases on big office buildings before COVID demand that their workers start coming back a few days a week. And there was um, an RBA um uh, I think it was in the um, one of their quarterly economic reports where they actually published some survey data of businesses, which did show some of that return to office um, manifesting in, in whether corporations would actually let people continue working remotely. So it's a really hard one to call and there are all sorts of different factors we um, should consider. Mm. Um, I think what is most likely, just given the general scenario that we're seeing where the performance gap is kind of closing between regions and capital cities anyway, is that most markets in Australia will probably see a slowdown in growth rates through 2022. And it's not all tied to migration patterns. It's more tied to just access to credit and some of the changes that are happening in that space. Are you anticipating that there'll be more, you know, macro prudential intervention? Good question. Um, I think it will be a wait and see. It is possible that between a potential downturn in the housing market in the next you know, couple of years, APRA will have done enough to take pressure off some of those more risky areas of the lending space. So that is my view that they're just going to wait for a few more data releases to make any kind of decisions around that. And we may find that there's a, a drop off in housing finance where they don't really have to make a further intervention. I think there is certainly some maybe even lessons learned from the last round of <laughs> macro prudential that we saw in 2017, which, you know, in our view, um, kind of triggered a peak to trough decline in housing values of about 9%. And in your investor concentrated markets like Sydney and Melbourne, it was closer to 15%. Uh, that's not the kind of shock I think that that um, the financial regulators would want to trigger for the sake of financial stability and the continuation of the Australian uh, COVID economic recovery. It's, it is always interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, access to credit, right, but then the knock-on effect of tightening that up is really is impact on confidence. And then, then that's then when everyone starts knee-jerking all over the place. And at the moment, everyone's overly confident, which is why they're piling into the market. Yeah. And, you know, FOMO is driving prices, it's driving asset choice, it's driving a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and, yeah, and, you know, and it's important to remember too that, like, this housing upswing was part of the design of the COVID recovery. It's not an unintended consequence of <laughs> low interest rates. It's the way that low interest rates deliver wealth effects, deliver economic activity through real estate transactions, construction, all this kind of thing. It is somewhat intentional that house prices are rising. Um, and it is when inflation is really ramping up and wages growth is higher that we would see that shift towards higher interest rates, which could then cool housing market um, dynamics. 
That's fascinating you said that because about the wealth effect because, mm. you know, what is it I heard, I think it was Ben Kingsley actually said that for every dollar that's spent in real estate, there's nine extra dollars spent into the economy. Is, is, is that, have I got that right? No, that that sounds um, about right, uh, given the concentration of employment in, uh, I would say, construction in particular. I mean, you never know the counterfactuals though, right? It mm. could be that for every dollar you invest in a woman's education, you return $12 to the economy. Or for every dollar you put into science and technology, you deliver $24 to the economy. So I'm hesitant to... Um, you know, spruik property investment uh, from from the <laughs> government planning sense, just looking at that statistic in isolation, because you have to say, well, what are the counterfactuals of investments in other assets that could potentially be more productive as well and give people more options for growing their wealth? Um, and that kind of comes back to the point around vilifying investors. It's like, how can you tell people to stop buying more property when it's delivering 22% increases in the space of a year. Maybe we should be putting more investment and attention into other facets of the economy that give people the opportunity to grow their wealth, especially where we're not seeing substantial increases to welfare payments for people in retirement or low income earners, you know, say for the um, increase in job seeker payments through COVID. Um, if you're going to tell people that they need to go off and sort their own wealth out, then you need to be prepared for a bit more speculation in, in assets like property. <laughs> I love that you raised this. And, and it is true that it's un an unusual to hear property people or people in the property market talk about anything other than property. <laughs> um, and so this is really great because it is a, it's a, it's a big picture I'm often saying to people, why do you think property is the only vehicle to invest in? But then I mm. guess what you're suggesting there is that really the whole system is set up to encourage people to to look to property. And then you, you, if it's a it's it's a gravy train that, that everyone else is on and you're not on, you, you obviously want to be on that gravy train. So the other thing that is interesting, because the flip side of that, when it comes to affordability argument, is that why would anybody want to tackle affordability if then it ran the risk of eroding existing values in property, because mm. of course the only way to make property more affordable is to have values drop, right? Well, I mean, and I'm talking in a very simplistic <laughs> sense, because the fact is the property is affordable because interest rates are so low. Yeah, it's just the actual saving the deposits the unaffordable bit. Um, so if, if we don't want to reduce the value, everybody's you know personal wealth, who's already on the on the gravy train but you want to make it affordable for other people to join the gravy train, it's sort of impossible riddle by the sounds of it. Yeah. <laughs> Can it be solved? You know, I mean, like, when we first met you back in 2018, you commented the Australian property market was too big to fail. And now I'm wondering, is it too big to make affordable? If you like what you're hearing here, please share this episode with others you feel would benefit. And while you're at it, why not leave us an iTunes review? Five stars, please. Every review helps make it easier for other people to find us and hear what our amazing guests have to say. We love hearing your questions and we're planning more listener Q&A episodes. Please send your questions in. You can send them via the website, which is theelephantintheroom.com.au or directly via email to questions at theelephantintheroom.com.au. Yeah, great, great summary. I mean, you're right in that there it, it's too simplistic to focus on affordability through that lens of house prices are high. You know, we've all, even in that Four Corners um, show you mentioned at the beginning, a lot of the messaging of that was look how spectacularly house prices have increased. That's not necessarily a problem. The problem is home ownership rates which have fallen dramatically over the past few decades. And I, you know, I've had some critiques of this in the past, but I actually think the Coalition's First Home Loan Deposit Scheme was a really interesting way to navigate that because literally the wording around that policy was we are um, helping Australians realise uh, or, okay, I'll par paraphrase because I can't remember the exact <laughs> quote, but it was, we're helping people realise the Australian dream of home ownership without affecting 
property values. It was a way that address it addressed home ownership rates by reducing the deposit hurdle and because that kind of didn't really affect demand and and wasn't intended to bring prices down you did have that dual goal of increasing home ownership and and maintaining property prices again it's kind of playing into the same systematic um, trend that we've had for the past few decades, but it's just notching up the numbers of of people who can get into the market, basically. Um, so, yeah, I, I thought that was an interesting policy to adopt, and that's kind of one example of how governments can can design things to address it, but it's not necessarily addressing the issue for everyone, for people who don't qualify. Um, and it's not addressing the broader systematic issues associated with with the property market and people's reliance on home ownership for wealth and comfort in retirement. I, I found that policy, and I've obviously through my other um, with my other hat, Home Buyer Academy, and the Your First Home Buyer Guide podcast, and the course that we do. You know, we've looked at all the different incentives across the country and of all of them, that's the one that we're most supportive of. And the main, and, and for lots of reasons, one of those that you've talked about, but also that it didn't have uh, the the uh, the proviso that you had to buy brand new. Mm, and yeah. I've got a big issue with, um, stim, you know, government stimulus is all about basically increasing demand generally you know, with all those throwing money at the problem. And and, and then they've got these artificial um, caps in terms of the price caps that sort of have this bulge of demand up to a certain price point, then nothing. And you've written on that in the past as well, I know. Um, but also it encourages then first home buyers to get into the property market all right, but buying assets that have a very high probability of losing value. So which is worse, I think, than not buying at all. I know that's a really sad thing to think that, especially with some of the apartment defects that we've seen across um, parts of the country in the past few years. Imagine taking out a mortgage that may be longer than the (laughs) lifetime of of the property, (laughs) right? It's very, you know, that kind of thing is very upsetting to see. Um, And yeah, and I think first home buyers tend to prefer established property anyway like if you look at some of the abs um housing and occupancy data historically a lot of those first home buyers a a greater proportion are going into established property historically um than you know second or third home buyers who who buy new because they're like building you know something new and architecturally appealing and all that kind of thing that's interesting i had i wasn't aware of that data so you're actually saying that um, upgraders or or movers, shall we say, second yeah. third, um, actually have a high proportion of buying off the plan. Yeah, they. Well, yeah. So I don't know that it's necessarily off the plan, or right. or if it's like something that they're building, but it was um, proportionally um, that housing and occupancy data from the ABS shows that first home buyers had a higher incidence of of buying uh, established property. Wow, there you go. Well, yeah. that's good because <laughs> it sort of leads me into my one of my favourite topics, the pain and gain <laughs> report. I'll, I'll get back to housing affordability in a minute because I do have a couple of more questions. But yeah, I've so I read the pain and gain report. It comes out every quarter. Uh, so it was the last report, most recent reports for the June quarter, twenty twenty one, and. I think the av- across Australia, eight and a half percent of properties that sold in that quarter sold at a loss. Yeah. Now, and I love then you dig deeper and you look at sort of the regions of property types and all the rest of it. And at its peak in I think 2018, I think it might have been as high as 13 percent sold yeah. at a loss. So I always sort of say it's 10 10 percent plus or minus. You know, it's somewhere hovering yeah. around that 10 percent mark. Yeah. So, but. Even in a boom, when when you've got areas across the country and a number of areas going up 30% in a 12-month period and you've got 8.5% of people that sold their property within that quarter sold at a loss. And I think this is the one of the messages that I like to get out there over and over again until people, <laughs> I'm blue in the face and <laughs> people are probably beaten around the ears. You, property is not a one-way ticket up. 
you know, no. it, it, it's pretty, and that's that's a nominal loss as well. We're not even covering yeah. stamp duty, in in cost, out cost, all the rest of it. So and Correct. renovations even. Yeah, yeah. So can you tell us a bit more about what was in what 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 interesting stuff came out of the most recent pain and gain report? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it it does show a lot of the trends that we've long seen where a higher incidence of loss making sales is often in markets that have a high concentration of investment properties um, and some of the more problematic markets i suppose in terms of capital growth and that continues to be you know perth and darwin where there's a relatively high portion of properties still selling at a loss interestingly though because there had been that recovery trend from uh, again late 2020 uh, the the proportion of loss making sales had actually declined pretty rapidly across Perth and Darwin um, other characteristics of loss making sales is basically uh, the unit segment and particularly in areas that had been affected by COVID so across inner city unit markets of Melbourne we're continuing to see that stagnation in prices, the loss of rental income. And what's really interesting is that uh, looking at rental listings across inner Melbourne through the COVID period, they shot up. Um, I think the the volume of rental listings across inner city Melbourne peaked at about 9,000 against a historic average of around 4,000. So more than doubling the rental stock in inner city Melbourne, which of course means you get higher vacancy rates, falling rental values, and that flows through to capital appreciation as well. Um, but at the same time, we started to see a tightening in those rental listings we saw for sale listing surge in that market, suggesting that investors were trying to offload these these properties and that's ultimately put downward pressure on prices as well. And that's led to this um, slight increase in the portion of loss making sales across the Melbourne LGA through the June quarter, where that, that was sitting at over 30% um, of, of sales making a, a nominal loss. Um, it's just, just, I just want to repeat that 30%. Yeah. Yeah. Inner Melbourne. So, yeah. and I know that there was a number of regions that do have double digits. Um, and, you know, if any, it, <laughs> I guess every now and then someone still argues with me about that. And I'm like, well, that's sort of recent data. There's quite old data as well showing over periods of time. But I guess what probably prompts some, a lot of people when they're sitting on a loss making asset, if it's not fe- effectively costing them anything, I've got rabbit ears mm-hmm. when I say that, um, where that, where, the rent's covering the mortgage. It's not hurting them too much. They're not paying attention really because they prefer not to recognise that loss um, or acknowledge it. And often people, the mentality is, well, I'll just, I'll keep it until it makes a gain and then I'll sell it. And potentially mm. that's what's prompted some sales in Darwin and um, Perth and therefore that actual proportion of loss making sales in those um, two cities has decreased for that reason yeah because there's more people now realizing a, a capital gain yeah yeah whereas in Melbourne you know with with a second with what six lockdowns um, there mm. would have been people that financially would have been under strain not just because of lack of rent but also because potentially they've, they've lost their own jobs as well or had to take a pay cut in that period. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think there's a, a range of challenges that have faced sellers in that market. Could also be that people, you know, they might be in an okay financial situation, but they're just looking to cut their loss um, with the potential to, you know, claim that loss against future property <laughs> value appreciation or, you know, maybe looking in another market. So I'm sure there are uh, multiple reasons that we'd be seeing quite a substantial amount of loss making sales. So I guess when you do have, it's sort of interesting, isn't it? They say that, you know, when the tide goes out, you see who's been who's swimming without their, their togs on. Um, <laughs> but in reality, in a way, the pain and gain report in a booming market really shows the outliers. It shows exceptions to the rule because yeah. a booming market can, can mask, I think I said that in the intro, it masks all sorts of failures, um, whereas that report sort of says, well, actually, there are people that are still hurting uh, in amongst all of this. Yeah, there are definitely still pockets. I mean, you get the other extreme as well where the one of the headline figures in the report is that 
people who had held for just the past two years had made a median gain on resales of over $100,000 at the national level. So this has been a particularly interesting time in that it highlights those extreme wins and it highlights those extreme losses as well. Are you doing any work on you know, what led to an extreme, what are the factors that contribute to an extreme win? Uh, I think just being in the market, <laughs> in, in this particular <laughs> market for the past two years, it's a 20% uplift in property values. I mean, the kinds of areas where we see the highest rate of profit-making sales historically have been high-end markets, mm. expensive markets like the Northern Beaches would be one, the eastern suburbs of Sydney. Um, and that this period has been no exception. A lot of the highest growth rates through the current upswing have been concentrated in expensive markets. What's also interesting is that we've seen a lot of areas in regional Victoria, so Ballarat, for example, which had a record high level of profitability through the June quarter. I think it was over 98% of um, resales making a profit. Uh, and of course, Tasmania, which we've talked about before, <laughs> which persistently has a very high rate of profit making sales as well well. So I'm sure in every market, there are individual property decisions where, um, you know, it's never going to make a gain just because of the nature of the property. Maybe it, it has a lot of structural issues or, or issues that you don't know about when, when you're buying. But a lot of the time, it does tend to be tied to um, you know, good locations, uh, detached houses see a higher incidence of, of profit making. And we also see that owner occupier sales have a higher incidence of profit making, which could just be tied to the longevity that owner occupiers have in the market relative to investors. I think also, when you sort of get into the nitty gritty of it, you need to look at the percentage of profits. Like you talk about the hundred thousand dollar profit mm, uh, yeah. on average, it's like well, a hundred thousand dollars on a one million dollar property is is ten percent. On a two million dollar property is five percent. So it's yeah. not as good on the two million, really good on the one million. And and obviously in those micro sense, in terms of micro decisions on, a, on an individual basis, in in every area there are properties that underperform and those that overperform, and that's that's the thing that getting in and understanding um, markets on a granular yeah. basis is really important when you're buying. I I find though, yeah, it is it is interesting to sort of because when you're choosing a location though, you know, there's a lot of ways in which data can help, and and I think that past. Uh, Past history, we we say, oh, you know, that's going to continue. It doesn't necessarily continue, but it certainly can give us some some good clues. You know, back to the sort of affordability thing. The, you know, I think there's a bit of a, a greater social problem that we've got potentially being created here. You know, that widening gap between those who have and those who don't. You know, we've seen dissatisfaction and unrest that this sort of um, gap can cause across the world, you know, and how agitators can actually turn it into social unrest. We've seen it in Melbourne even, you know, in terms of mm. just shutting down the construction industry and, and you know, people feeling disenfranchised and then, then vulnerable, I guess, to being recruited, if you like, or, or they're angry and, and they want to make their, uh, their, their dissatisfaction known. Do you personally have any ideas for what really needs to be tackled I mean, you, you alluded to some earlier, but to make housing more equitable in this country without basically undermining and damaging the whole house of cards, it's not really a house of cards, so it's a <laughs> bit more solid than that, but, you know, without disrupting what already exists, you know, what clever ideas do you have? I'm curious. I think it's probably something I've talked about before, but we really need to just look at other ways that Australians can grow their wealth and be secure in retirement. And that either comes from, you know, better financial education around how you could grow your money through shares or, mm. you know, other, other kinds of asset investments, or you would have to increase, um, I would say, welfare payments that, that can help people with their housing costs. So I, I believe it's that um, Commonwealth rental assistance payment, for example, like increasing that. because. You know, one of the main issues with um, not getting into the property market, like it might not matter 
throughout your life as a you know full-time employed adult whether you're working or um sorry whether you're renting or whether you own mm. where it matters is when you know you're 65 70 years old your income has to come way down because you're entering retirement if you're still paying private market rents by that point in your life then that has been shown to be the difference between a life of uh, poverty or retirement that is comfortable yeah so in order to address that particular social issue i think you would need to increase um, government support for those people that are going to be stuck renting in retirement so uh, that's probably one of the you know smallest least disruptive things you could do there are economists who you know have it like there's this more radical economist cameron murray whose work i've followed for a long time who's like well let's just build a house for everyone (laughs) treat it like social infrastructure literally just supply a housing unit for for everyone in australia and continue to develop it you know um there are economists who have said well we need to take a more serious look at australia's you know, migration policy and and do we want a big Australia or do we have to limit that? And I don't necessarily, um, you know, subscribe to that idea, but it's interesting, the spectrum. Um, And I think what we really need to do is just come together and say, at the root of this, we need to determine, do we want to keep the financial system as it is, which is what the government has been working towards for decades, which is to say you need to sort yourself out in retirement mm. and home ownership is going to be a part of that. Um, that's the thing I think we need to address. Do we try and detangle that system or do we lean into it and employ more things like the first home loan deposit scheme and then just increase you know, social housing or Commonwealth rental, rental assistance for people who can't get into that system because the problem at the moment is that the government assumes that everyone will be on that path to home ownership and doesn't really worry about the people at the margins. Yeah, it's, it is very, it is really tangled, as you say, and, you, and to disentangle it and there's just so much self-interest. And, you know, I yeah. myself am self-interested, let's face it, I'm building entire career on property and, and I, I invest in property myself, I own my own home. Um, but there's got to be a better way. Yeah, you know, and, in, and in weird way, Veronica, like so am I. Like I don't own property, but I don't necessarily want the property market to crash mm. because my parents are relying on their property for wealth in retirement. And if their property value goes down, mm. I'm probably going to have to look after them and support <laughs> them with their lifestyle costs. And I'm like, I want them to be self-sufficient as well. I think politically, until you get to a stage where the majority of Australians are renting instead of owning, Owning, you're probably not going to see much motivation. I could be really wrong about that. Like maybe people who own property d- are looking beyond their self interest and, and want to help people who you know aren't don't own. But I think generally you'd need the majority of people to be in a really disruptive housing situation for things to change politically. Well, yeah, I mean, like now the the housing market in Australia is worth nine trillion dollars. Yeah. You know, I thought it was a lot when it was seven, and then it dipped <laughs> under seven. You know, in two thousand eighteen, didn't I it? Know. You know, it was like, <laughs> and um, even that, it's worth more than any. It's it actually it's worth more than all the other asset classes in this country combined. You Correct. know, so yeah, yeah. um, yeah, it's pretty outrageous really when you see how big it is and then of course who dominates our stock market the banks and what's the what's the banks the dominant industry that the banks are in lending money for for housing um but yeah but if people are locked out of the party they're not going to be too happy about that and and at the moment it seems to be really there doesn't appear to be the government will you know in in a greater sense to actually develop policy around this it seems to be that it's um there are smaller providers and smaller um, uh, players who are actually coming up with, you know, uh, local solutions, if you like. Yeah, and I think that's been quite intentional as well, is Mm. to try and increase efficiency in this space by outsourcing to the community housing groups instead of a government-led social housing initiative. I think we have grand gradually see that over time not necessarily a bad thing and to be honest i don't know too much about 
that particular space. Um, but I can see how having localized groups that are more familiar with the needs of their community could be a good thing. Yeah. And we see really terrible examples of public housing and just look in Waterloo, Redfern, those towers, you know, and, and down in, in Melbourne, you've got Richmond, you've got South Melbourne, you've got, you know, all the way around. Um, they can't be great places to live in. You know, they um, when COVID hit, oh, my God, the vulnerabilities of the, those populations. I know, um, I know. Struck and the well. treatment, you know, because it, mm. it's not a well-integrated social housing situation. It's almost like this little block that you can isolate or, yeah, it was yeah. awful. Terrible. So, yeah, so hopefully, um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm feeling my socialist side. I'm a, I'm a swing <laughs> voter, just so anyone knows. I <laughs> I will I will vote on issues, but I've got this little socialist bug bug sort of buzzing around me at the moment. Now, Eliza, this has been a really interesting conversation. I really appreciate it. And obviously, we've we've sort of gone through. Well, is the property market about? Is it slowing? Is it not? You know, who's losing? Who's winning? Uh, and also um, around this sort of idea of affordability and, and really what's causing it. And it's been an interesting chat about the regions as well. Have you got a property dumbo for us today? Um, I uh, maybe a friend of a friend who's definitely not me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Love those ones. Yeah. Uh, just get, get invest in some decent appliances for your rentals and some decent tradespeople. Um, my, my friend of a friend has been without <laughs> hot water in their rental for five days. Oh. And the amount of different people that we've that they have had to get out to to the property I, I can't imagine is saving the owner much money. So, um, it sounds like maybe invest in a good property manager. Maybe is that yeah. the oh. <laughs> no? Yes. Oh, so I, I mean, we could have a whole nother podcast about this, but I'm fascinated at at the kind of systematic pressures on property managers at the moment as well. The consolidation of rent rolls through COVID and that kind of thing mm. seems like it's tough to get a property manager who's got a workload that they can manage really effectively. Um, but yeah, maybe a good property manager, good appliances and um, good plumbers. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's actually quite a lot of, um, might have to do some interviews on the prop tech space because there's quite a lot of innovation mm. going on to, you know, provide, I guess, um, technology solutions to ease the workload on property managers. But I was actually listening to uh, one of Amanda Farmer, your, your Strata Property episodes recently about strata managers as well, uh -huh. you know, and, you know, property managers in, manage individual properties, strata managers run, manage buildings. And the problem comes back to, well, what are they being paid to manage yeah. these buildings? And have they, A, got the bandwidth to um to be able to spend the time necessary to manage them properly, but also B, are they actually educated and qualified in that space anyway? Because of obviously as as values of properties go up, the the risks of having them poorly managed goes up as well, you know, and, and poorly managed can go with training and education, et cetera, et cetera. So there's another complicated can of mm. worms that we could potentially get into is that the supporters in this the supporting roles in this industry are not adequately funded. And as yeah. consumers, do we really want to pay enough to make sure that they're adequately funded? Yeah. And and that's the thing. I'm I'm not a big believer in like vilifying property managers and strata managers and things like that. I think it, if if you've got problems that are so commonplace, it can't be the individual. Like it's got to be something wrong. Systemic. Yeah, exactly. Um but yeah, I, I look forward to hearing any work you do on that, Veronica. And I think um, I'm loving listening to the podcast. So keep it up. I think you guys are doing such a great job. Well, thank you. Thanks for that too. And thanks for coming along and chatting to us. And uh, I think it's been a while, so we won't leave it that long before we talk to you again. Really appreciate your time. And no, anytime. Thanks for having me again. If you're looking to buy your dream home or an investment property in Sydney's inner west, eastern suburbs or North Shore, my team and I can help you buy without regrets. Reach out via my website, gooddeeds.com.au. If you're looking to buy your first home, thinking of upgrading into a new one or purchasing an investment property anywhere in Australia, my team love to carefully guide you on this journey. And most importantly, get the finance right. Reach out via our website, wealthful.com.au. 
Thanks for joining us. We'd love to see you again. And remember, don't be a Dumbo. Woo!